an external event proving that he was immortal. And so he, he became more cohesive internally so that he could do what he did later on with more ease. Following that day, he walked freely in trenches under heavy fire, creating a legend for himself among his troops. After Mustafa Kamal's charges on August the 9th and 10th, not a single strategic hill was in Allied hands. The mighty British Empire had been defeated at Gallipoli. Winston Churchill lost his position as First Lord of the Admiralty. Mustafa Kamal's reputation spread among his colleagues and the people. British official history states, seldom in history can the exertions of a single divisional commander have exercised on three different occasions so profound an influence not only on the course of a battle, but perhaps on the fate of a campaign, even the destiny of a nation. He demonstrated both on the 25th of April and again in August that he had a driving ruthlessness which the British commanders often lacked. They weren't prepared to drive their men as hard as he was. He acted with decision and vigor and prevented the potential of an attack from opening out. And I think at those three points, you could say he managed to turn the tide of those particular battles. And in that way, through doing it three times, he would emerge as the leading character from the whole campaign. Mustafa Kamal came to Gallipoli, an outcast by his government, and left as a national hero. Unfortunately, the Ottoman victory at Gallipoli could not prevent the inevitable. The situation of the Ottoman Empire and her allies deteriorated rapidly. Defeat seemed certain. The Entente powers had already started to make plans to splice the empire, with Italy, France, England and Greece all hoping and waiting for a share of the spoils. After his service at Gallipoli, Mustafa Kamal was promoted to general. Battling with malaria that he had contracted in Tripoli, he continued to fight as an army commander in the east against the Russians and in the southeast against Allenby's British forces. He not only gained invaluable experience in many different corners of the country, but also started to form more compact ideas for the future. October the 30th, 1918. The Ottoman Empire with a new Sultan, Vat Edin, surrendered to the British at the island of Madras. The Allies immediately began to occupy different regions of the country. The same day that the Allied fleet sailed into the Bosphorus, Mustafa Kemal returned to Istanbul. He was the only Ottoman commander that never suffered a defeat during World War I. And it, it was as a result of that that he had a tremendous reputation among the mass of the people. He added to that reputation because as soon as the armistice was signed, he openly and vociferously declared that it was unfair to the Turks and should never have been signed. Looking at the anchored enemy ships and feeling disgraced, he said, as they have come, so shall they go. The Turkish struggle for independence had started. The entrance of the Allies into Istanbul was celebrated enthusiastically by the Greek and Armenian minorities in the city. With the cooperation of the Sultan, the British immediately took control of the capital. Flags of the occupational forces were everywhere. Crime was rampant and the future of the country was uncertain. In a few months, as the invaders signed new agreements amongst themselves, it became clear to Mustafa Kemal and his friends that the Allies not only sought to occupy the country, but also intended to dismember it among themselves. The only glimmer of hope for the Turks were the independent resistance groups, known collectively as the Defense of Rights Association, which opposed the occupations in their isolated regions. 
Realizing that the situation in Istanbul was hopeless, Mustafa Kemal began to look for other alternatives for the salvation of the country. Winning the support of Hussein Rauf, the naval hero of the Balkan Wars, along with Kiazim and Ali Fouad, the commanders of the only remaining military forces, he decided that the salvation lay in Anatolia. Anatolia was largely Turkish at this time. And he felt that if the Turks were going to resist the Allies, it had to be from the heartland of the Turkish people, namely Anatolia, that this resistance could be organized. Under pressure from the British, the Sultan sought a commander who would supervise the surrender of the remaining Turkish troops in Anatolia. Mustafa Kemal volunteered for the job. The Sultan trusted Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal did not trust the Sultan, but he was close to the Sultan, and he made use of his relationship with the Sultan in order to secure the kind of command which he needed to lead the Turkish National Resistance Movement. Having been bestowed with great authority, he could command the two army corps in Anatolia and give orders to the mayors of five provinces. It would not be long before the Sultan and the British regretted disappointment. As Mustafa Kemal made preparations to embark on his journey, British Prime Minister Lloyd George authorized and supported a Greek landing on the western coast of the country at Izmir on May the 15th, 1919. The Greeks, in secret consultation with Lloyd George, agreed that this would not be temporary, but would be a permanent occupation. And to make sure of this, when they landed at Izmir, Instead of simply taking nominal control, they began large-scale massacres of the Turks and the Jews who lived there in order to encourage them and also the Turks and Jews living elsewhere in western Anatolia to flee as they did. Four days after the Greek landing, Mustafa Kemal landed on the Black Sea coast of the country the fight for Anatolia had begun. From then on, it is impossible to uh, do anything but consider the life of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk and the life of Turkey bound together. And what happens up until his death and even afterwards uh, stems from that moment. The Turks were in a very difficult position. The Greeks had occupied all of Thrace and southwestern Anatolia. The Italians had occupied southern Anatolia. The French had occupied southeastern Anatolia, so-called Cilicia, as well as Syria, and uh, others had occupied northeastern Anatolia. At the same time, the British had maintained a blockade of Anatolia, which resulted that no food could be imported from outside, while at the same time, agriculture in Anatolia was almost at a standstill and there was no transportation. With the result, there was no food, no fuel, no clothing, people were starving, People were dying as a result of famine. Given the circumstances under which they had to operate and the challenges they were facing, that I know of no other military leader that faced such formidable challenges as that occurred. After all the years of war and negligence by the central government, the Turkish people, whom Mustafa Kemal was now to turn to, were worn out and depleted. He had to shake and awaken the people who had always considered themselves the subject of the Sultan from centuries.